In this video, we will discuss basic usage of the iRanges package. Let's load it. An iRanges is a vector that contains integer intervals. Sounds a little funny, but let's take an example. We construct an iRanges by using the iRanges constructor function, and we give two out of three arguments, start, end, and width. We only need two because if we know two of them, the last one can be inferred. So here we have a start and end and width, and we can see the width uh, column has been filled uh, by knowing the start and the end. Here we construct a, another I range by specifying the start and the width, and we get exactly the same object out. We access the different components of the I ranges vector using access functions that are named start, end, and width. So if we examine write start of I range, we get back a vector of the start positions of these different intervals. We can also set the elements of the I ranges using these access functions. In this case here, we have resized uh, the different ranges to have width one. And we can see we use the start position as the anchor point of the resizing. There's a more flexible function that allows a more flexible resizing. Uh, not surprisingly, it's called resize, and we'll discuss it briefly below. I ranges can have names like any other vector. And because they're vectors, even though they, they look a little bit like matrices, they don't have a dimension, they have a length and we subset them using a single bracket uh, with a single uh, index, either an integer index or the name exactly as we know it from any other vector. We also can concatenate two I ranges that we can concatenate any vector. A specific type of I range uh, that's uh, very important because we encounter it again and again in usage is something called a normal I ranges. And that's a little hard to explain at first, so let's plot them and um, see some examples. So first we evaluate a function here that allows us to plot these things. We uh, make sure we can uh, plot uh, two uh, things at the same time. We get us an I range and uh, we plot it. So here we have an I range, and as you as you should have seen before, uh, there's no requirement that the different intervals inside the I range are non-overlapping. Uh, we have two intervals uh, on the left that are clearly overlapping. So you can think of this, for example, as exons in the genome. A normal I range is created by the reduce function, and it's a minimal representation of um, the original I range as a set. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that each integer that belongs to one or more of the original ranges belongs to a single range. Furthermore, the ranges are as big as they can be. If you look uh, to the right of the picture, uh, the two ranges have been merged into one, and they're also sorted so that the first element in the output is the element most to the left on the diagram. So this is kind of a minimal representation uh, of the integers that belongs to the original I ranges. And uh, we'll see uh, uh, many functions that output normal I ranges. In a way, the inverse to uh, reduce is a function called disjoint that can be uh, incredibly handy when you need it. But it, I, found it, I found that I mostly use it in sort of esoteric circumstances. So disjoint here, uh, creates kind of also a, a set of disjoint intervals. Um, um, so disjoint non-overlapping intervals. When you manipulate I ranges, there are a set of functions that does kind of a, a straightforward manipulation. And uh, one way of manipulating I ranges is a manipulation that takes all of the original ranges and produces a single new range for each of the original ranges. One uh, example of that is uh, the resize function. 
So let's uh, close this off here. And, um, and look at resize. So here we have an eye ranges of length four and uh, we resize them uh, around uh, the start position. You can see the fixed argument here that tells us that we want to resize them to a width one. We fix them to have around the start position. More useful in my experience is to resize them from the center of the intervals. Uh, in this case here, the original ranges had even number of uh, elements and uh, the start position becomes the element like to the left of the midpoint. There are other types of manipulation such as shift, flank, and so on. Another way of manipulating, manipulating eye ranges is thinking of eye ranges as sets of integers. In other words, uh, converting them to normal eye ranges first. And then we can think about doing stuff like union and intersection. So let's take two eye ranges here uh, and, uh, and, and look at them. So we can take the union of them and we can see what comes out of it is a normal eye range. We have, um, we have merged things together. Um, and you can see here that uh, in a way uh, the union yeah, we have merged the, we have merged the uh, 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 neighboring intervals together. Another way of saying that is, is that the union is equal to first concatenating the two I ranges together and then calling reduce. We can also do intersection and set difference. Now, the real power horse of the I ranges library is the find overlaps function. And find overlaps allows us to uh, relate two, of se two sets of eye ranges, uh, two eye ranges to each other. Let's take an example here. Um, let's look at them. And now we're going to do the overlap between them. Oh. So the output of the find overlaps function is this two-dimensional matrix, or it looks like a two-dimensional matrix. Um, when I call find overlaps, I give it a query and a subject. And that's what the two columns of the hits object here refers to. So the hits object is really a, an adjacency matrix, or it is a matrix of uh, indices of the different overlaps. So the first row or the first element of the hits object means that range number one in the query overlaps range number one in the subject. So let's uh, take let, let's let's uh, ref, let's verify that by hand. So range number one of the query is uh, IR one and one and IR and element one of IR two, and we can see that these two ranges indeed overlap. And we have three overlaps in total, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and this gives us the indices. We can access the query hits and the subject hits uh, through the query hits and the, and the subject hits access of functions. So uh, let's do this overlap here and we get out basically uh, the column of, of, what looks like, of what looks like a matrix here. Note that there are um, repeat elements of the query hits because uh, range number two in the query overlaps multiple ranges in the subject. It's very common to call unique on both query hits and subject hits. In this case here, unique would give us um, exactly the uh, elements of the query that overlap anything in the subject. Find overlaps is a complicated function. Uh, it has a lot of uh, arguments that allows us to uh, deal with uh, uh, whether or not there should be a minimal overlap, uh, whether or not the overlap should just be uh, like we've done it here, or an overlap means that they should be exactly equal to each other, for example. 
Uh, and there's also a way of specifying what should be returned. Should it be all the possible overlaps or just the first overlap you encounter and so on and so forth. Um, this takes a while to become totally comfortable with and we will see more uses of it throughout the class. There's a, a, a quick function. So in many cases, when you're running find overlaps, you're not really interested in the exact overlaps. You're just interested in how often do I see overlaps in a, between a query set and a subject set. And for this, we have the convenience function count overlaps that uh, returns a vector. In this case, it means that range number one in IR1 overlaps one element of IR2, element two overlaps two elements of IR2. That's uh, represented in the hits object uh, above. And element number three doesn't overlap anything at all. Count overlaps is faster and more memory efficient, uh, which matters a lot if you use this for extremely big I ranges. And we will be using it for extremely big I ranges. Finally, uh, we can also relate uh, I ranges in a different way uh, than through the overlaps. We can look at uh, well, at, at which ones are close to each other. So again, we take our two I ranges and we can ask which of these I ranges are, which of the I ranges in IR1 are close, like, which of the I ranges in IR2 are closer to the ones in IR, in IR1. So in this way, in, in, this case, in this case, we can match them up. This is actually a function we use a lot in genomics. It could be something like we have a peak or we have a region of interest and we want to find the nearest gene. So this was an introduction to the basic uses of the iRanges packets. We are going to uh, see more advanced uses of the packets in, laser, in, la in later videos. And this package is, is basically providing the foundation of the genomic ranges packets that we will uh, discuss again and again in this class.